Well, you're quite in front, so you don't have to. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was going to say, like, it's uh, quite strange standing up here on the, on the stage that my kids um, kind of performed on, but it, I'm not because that just this building didn't exist when they were actually not using the people over there. Um, yeah. So I suppose the themes we're looking at this evening are human conflict, the struggle against repression, defiance, and heroism in the face of authoritarian adversity. Perhaps most importantly, learning to live in peace with people you just fought a war against. What's happening in Ukraine seems to belong to another age, a ghastly European tragedy of the type we thought we'd seen the last of. Scenes of death, destruction and mass displacement that should by rights be played out in black and white newsreel footage. Having recently spent a lot of time researching the Spanish Civil War, I'm certainly seeing a lot of grim parallels, sights and sounds that I never imagined would tarnish our continent's history again. I did that research for a book called Welter Skelter, which by eerie coincidence is out in paperback next Thursday. <laughs> it's about a very long bike ride I did around Spain in the lockdown summer of 2020, retracing the route of the 1941 Welter a España, that country's national bike race. While the rest of the planet was embroiled in a world war, in 1941 Spain had recently emerged from an absolutely horrendous civil conflict in which 500,000 people met their deaths, half of them non-combatants, executed by General Franco's Falange's death squads for so-called offences that included wearing a red tie or being friends with someone who read the wrong newspaper. The 1941 welter would be won by Julian Berendero, a Spanish cyclist who had shot to fame five years earlier in the 1936 Tour de France, winning the prestigious King of the Mountains competition in what was his first ever race outside Spain. Halfway through that tour, the Spanish Civil War broke out and Berendero, an anti-Franco Republican like the rest of his Spanish teammates, made his feelings plain in a righteous interview with the French press. But by the end of the race, it had become ominously clear that Franco and his nationalists were very likely to win the war. And given his published quotes, Berendero felt it safer to stay on in France. After three years, the outbreak of the Second World War obliged him to cross the border back into Spain. His friends in Madrid had assured him that his anti-Franco interview was long forgotten, but they were wrong. The man I came to call J.B. was arrested as he stepped off his train in September 1939, and he spent the following 18 months in a succession of Franco's Spanish concentration camps. One morning on the parade ground of a camp based in a burned-out tuna canning factory on a beach near Cadiz, Berendera was picked up by one of the camp captains, who ordered him to report to his office. In his last interview, given just before he died in 1995, J.B. recalled that prisoners summoned thus were generally never seen again. But when the captain closed his door, he rushed over to embrace Berendero with tears in his eyes. Don't you recognize me, he asked. He told me he was Jose Leona, an amateur cyclist from Bilbao who had raced with me before the war. Then he led me to his desk and offered me the plate of breakfast that lay on it, two fried eggs and potato. This was the first proper meal that had been put in front of Berendero for over a year. It tasted like heaven, like glory. Somehow, presumably at no small personal risk, Captain Lona managed to wangle Berendero's release. Just two months later, having spent his athletic prime eating rotten scraps behind barbed wire, Julian Berendero lined up on the 1941 Welter start line in Madrid. His victory three weeks later was the last chapter in an incredible tale of sporting redemption. This book was some way off from my usual subject matter, which tends to focus on the cycling misadventures of an ageing and hopelessly unprepared idiot. <laughs> Though inevitably there is quite a lot of that in the bit I'm about to read out. <laughs> I also have an unwise weakness for ancient machinery, having ridden the route of the 1914 Tour of Italy on a 1914 bicycle with wooden wheels, and cycled all the way down the old Iron Curtain on a communist-era East German shopping bike. Things weren't quite so ridiculous this time. I managed to borrow a racing bike that its owner called La Berendero. It had been sold in the shop JB opened after his retirement, with his name emblazoned all over the frame. That said, it was almost 50 years old. Um, so now there's a, a bit of book is coming up here. Perhaps probably slightly too long, but there we go. With just 32 starters, the 1941 Welter still ranks as the smallest ever Grand Tour. The race organisers hoped to atone through sheer immensity of distance. At 4,442 kilometres, it was and remains the longest bicycle race in Spanish history. 
And so, on the morning of June the 12th, a modest peloton gathered in front of officials and spectators outside the Ministry of Sport and Leisure's HQ on the Cala de Alfonso in downtown Madrid. On dutiful queue, every right arm was raised in fascist salute, and every voice joined a rendition of Cara al Sol, Face to the Sun, the Phalangist Anthem. <coughs> Baron Dero would have known the words better than anyone, having been obliged to sing it twice a day in the camps, where any mistake of the lyrics earned an automatic beating. At 8 a.m. sharp, the start flag was lowered by the Spanish Cycling Federation's new president, General Luzquiano, a natural career progression for Franco's erstwhile deputy chief of staff. 79 years and three weeks later, pedalling through the welcome shade of the plane trees that lined the Calle de Alfonso, I set off in their ghostly wheel tracks. In the total absence of tourists and with the Saturday traffic dramatically thinned by lockdown, it wasn't too hard to imagine the scene. As I rolled down the six lane avenues, the loudest noise was the buzz of crickets getting busy in the formal gardens alongside. Back home, I'd spent a great deal of time inputting the 1941 route into Komoot, my phone's bike focused navigation app, harvesting stage details from Berendera's autobiography and from contemporary sports reports in Spain's impressively comprehensive online newspaper archives. What a shame that my hopelessly stunted grasp of Spanish had obliged me to consult these splendid resources through the wayward auto-translation miracle of Google Lens. Ever tried it? You fire the app up, aim your phone camera at whatever you want translated, and the software's best efforts appear on the screen. Sometimes I'd pop my phone at yellowed page or PC monitor and see fully formed cogent revelations take shape before my widened eyes. But sometimes runners were thrown into trumpets and Champion Wood delivered by Walnut Conference. The 1941 race kicked off with a 45-minute neutralised parade through the centre. I followed it down the wide and graceful Gran Via. During the Civil War, Gran Via had been known as Howitzer Alley, aligned as it was with the nationalist artillery emplacements that looked down on Madrid from those mighty western hills. From the end of the war until 1981, Gran Via was named Avenida de José Antonio, in honour of the founding father of phalangism and composer to the lyrics of Carol El Sol, Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera. Four decades of dictatorship ended with Franco's death in 1975, but Spain has yet to retitle all the countless streets and squares named after the general and his friends. Then it was out around Franco's victory arch, a pound shop Arc de Triomphe finished in 1956. Marooned on a vast traffic island, it looked rather feeble and forlorn an impression compounded by the graffiti daubed over its lower reaches and by the skateboarders slaloming through the beer bottles and chunks of displaced marble cladding streamed beneath it. The arch must be the most blatant surviving symbol of Franco's regime, but the civic authorities appear to have felt that knocking it down would have been a statement too far. Instead, they've gone for a kind of managed decline, crowbarring out the phalangist yoke and arrow motifs and removing all identifying signage. I freewheeled round the arch next to a bus, wondering if the driver or his passengers ever thought about what it represented, whether indeed they even noticed it. As I would find out, the Spanish are very good at letting uncomfortable history hide in plain sight. The arch wasn't built when the 1941 peloton filed through, but the aftermath of the victory it originally commemorated, commemorated would have lain all around. An extraordinary photo accompanied El Mundo Deportivo's stage one race report showing the riders pedalling by shattered hulks of institutional grade structures, carefully captioned, the welter passes the glorious ruins of University City. In November 1936, with a nationalist just 300 metres from the centre of Madrid, a fierce and surreal battle raged across this sprawling campus. At times, the front line ran through laboratories and libraries. Machine gun nests were built out of encyclopedias and bombs sent up in lifts. Almost every building would be shelled to oblivion. Anthony Beaver, who ought to know, called it a foretaste of Stalingrad. After the fighting hit a stalemate, both sides dug in for two years, leaving trenches and bunkers that are still visible at the northern end of University City. For the first time, but by no means the last, I realised that although the overarching intention of the race was to bring Spain together, on a micro level, its route was carefully plotted in order to remind the country who had won the war by rubbing the losers' noses right in it. The first stage ran up the Coruña Road, route of Franco's first assault on the capital, a highway whose final suburban stretch is still named Victory Avenue. 
and the stage would end at Salamanca, Franco's military headquarters throughout the war. Actually, I didn't realise any of that, at least not in any coherent manner. In these early stages, I was rather more focused on getting to grips with the absurd heat, the mind-melting scale of my undertaking, and most immediately, this new old bike of mine. La Berendero, which its owner Gerardo reckoned had been wheeled out of JB's shop in 1975, was a dream machine in this day, a bike my youthful self would have lusted after. It had a full Campagnolo Nuovo Grand Sport group set, gears, brakes, pedals, hub, seat, post, the lot. Not quite the range-topping Nuovo record that took Eddie Merckx to five Tour de France wins, but near enough. It had slender Mavic rims, upon which Gerardo had fitted a pair of narrow, retro-profile Mavic tyres. And perhaps most thrillingly for someone whose teenage years were spent hankering in vain for a bike with that coveted green and gold sticker on its down tube, it had a slender frame fashioned from Reynolds 531 steel tubing. Yet here's the tragic thing. No matter what my breathtakingly fresh-faced good looks might suggest, <laughs> 40 years have passed since I experienced those vain hankerings. Yes, La Barandera represented an intergalactic upgrade on the wooden wheel centenarian I'd ridden around Italy, and on the East German shopper that took me down the Iron Curtain. But it was still an extremely old bicycle. Bikes had got an awful lot better over the last 40 years, whereas I hadn't. Before setting off down the Cala del Fonso, I was already slick with a sweat of effort and terror. The undulating ride from the shop where I'd picked La Berendero up had demonstrated that a 1970s road bike, with lots of bags and an old man on it, didn't like going up hills or down them. The gearing seemed cruelly inadequate for a 56-year-old whose training rides had taken in nothing more vertical than a humpback railway bridge. There were six sprockets at the rear and two at the front. This pair to my untrained eye seemed rather too big. Their hindward counterparts, as well as being far too few in number, were also far too small. Shifting between them, for what good it did, involved applying great manual forces to the dainty little levers on the down tube. I've only ever ridden one bike that required me to take my hands off the bars in order to change gear. That was a 10-speed pook, a well-intentioned parental attempt to make my 16th birthday one to remember. I've certainly never forgotten it. By the time I blew my candles out that evening, both gear cables had snapped and La Berendero's brakes, despite similar inputs of brute strength, had already seen me judder to a wayward halt several feet beyond two red lights. My extended unfamiliarity with toe clips was the olive in this old crack cocktail. <laughs> At one junction, I had to use a bloke on an e-scooter to break my fall. <laughs> he was pretty good about it, at least until he noticed my uncovered face. Mascarilla! Mascarilla! I'd been assured that cyclists didn't have to wear face masks in Spain. A belated look around informed me this exemption did not apply in an urban setting. Blinking sweat out of my eyes, I did my best to follow the stage one directions, as displayed on the phone mounted rather perilously to the handlebar stem. The 1941 race proper had begun at the Puerta de Hierro, a fancy Baroque arch, but I never did find it. After I got home, I found out why. The monument occupies a landscape traffic island defined by several branches of the highway A6 and M30, an enclave which is difficult to access. Camus led me a merry dance around and over many such alluring interchanges, then into a gravel-tracked, pine-lined park full of weekend cyclists. La Berendera's back wheels slipped and scrabbled, dispatching dusty plumes that enveloped the family pelotons behind. I laboured across a hinterland of railway marshalling yards, then through the broiled and silent commuter suburbs. One introduced itself as Maja da Honda, fuzzily familiar from my research both as a dreadful battleground in the Civil War's first winter and as a landmark location in the cyclist's fledgling career. Thirty hours later, in a slightly more capable state of mind, I refreshed myself with the details. In December 1936, 30,000 men died at Maja Honda in a chaotic, fog-bound fog -bound free-for-all with the International Brigade, that volunteer army of foreign anti-fascists, bettering the brunt. One IB commander, setting a template for the heroic but tragically self-destructive defiance that would define Republican battle tactics, ordered his men not to cede an inch of territory under any circumstances. In consequence, a battalion that had been formed two months early with 1,500 men was reduced to just 35. And four years before that, Julian Berendera had fought his own battle at the 1932 tour of Maja Honda. Leading the field in a two-man break, Berendera received a hefty punch from his fellow escapee that knocked him over at speed. He picked himself out of the gutter and, in a rage, set off in pursuit. 
despite a jammed pedal, he caught his assailant, swung a payback right-hander, then powered away to take his first big win. Only after crossing the line did he notice the gaping wound in his arm, which would put him out of action for the rest of the 1932 season. I suppose that could have been an inspiration, had I remembered it out on the road. I would have been very glad of it, because with Madrid sitting amidst barely behind me, I was already in all sorts of bother. The digital readouts outside every pharmacy said it was over 40 degrees centigrade, and at 4pm still rising. Desperate, raging thirst regrettably shouted down the smaller voice of hunger, and soon the dizzy sweats of calorific deficit came served with a side order of ominous leg tremors. How ghastly are those preludial cramped trolley walls? It's as if your legs have been possessed, as if some horrible thrashing alien is about to burst straight out through your flesh. The first high voltage bolt of agonising cramp harpooned my left calf on a gently rising bike path by a dual carriageway, all but throwing me off into the crispy dead grass. Almost in tears of pain and shame, I raggedly dismounted and pushed uphill for a good kilometre the great man's name glaring reproachfully at me from all over La Berendero's frame. It's ridiculous, but every time I set off on these rides, I do so secretly wondering if I'll find myself bursting into some late-onset physical pomp. For this one, I'd even entertained a theory that my brush with Covid might prove ben beneficial in a kind of what-doesn't-kill-you-makes-you-stronger fashion. A bit like Lance Armstrong coming back from cancer to win seven straight tours, only without the enormous doping programme. <laughs> The doctors aren't quite sure how to explain it, but at 56, Moore is riding like a man half his age. This is a slow burn talent that the national selectors can hardly continue to ignore, particularly when it comes in such a sexy package. <laughs> it seemed a bit rude that I wasn't even granted a day, one single day, to sustain this fantasy before it was put to the sword so brutally and so very painfully. Oh well, as always next time. I threw the towel at Al Padrete, a small town in the rolling brown foothills that led up to the Alto de los Leones, the pass across the Guadarrama Mountains that I had confidently expected to conquer that day. 64 kilometres of utter humiliation, shorts pulled down and pallid buttocks spanked red. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too hot to make exercise, thrilled a masked woman behind the guesthouse reception plexiglass when I dropped my passport on her desk. Pulling my own mask on in stifling heat in a state of utter exhaustion, I felt like having a hot hand pressed over my mouth. I managed a nod which sank into a head drop when she invited me to ferry La Berendero to its overnight quarters, a basement at the bottom of two narrow, twisting flights of stairs. I've only retained flash frames of that shattered debut evening, getting down and dirty with all those ugly, half-remembered rituals of life on the road. There I am, slumped in the shower, mumbling a semi-conscious stream of profanity, giving my kit a half hour sluice in the B-Day, and struggling into my Acre cycling outfit, whose dominant feature was a pair of crimpling golf trousers I had seen recommended on some cyclotouring forum for their light weight and crease resistance. Even my impaired critical faculties could sense they were laughably awful, shiny and shapeless, not so much Rory McElroy striding down the 18th, as Angela Merkel shuffling up to the lectern. <laughs> I weaved out into the hot evening in no fit state to appreciate or even really notice my surroundings. A lot of widows and whitewash, a lot of tattooed youths on scooters. More by accident and design, I wound up in Al Padrete's compact, bar-lined town square and half sat, half fell into a chair at the nearest empty table. Para comer? The waiter responded to my request with a look of frank amusement as if instead of asking him what there was to eat, I just invited him to draw on my face. <laughs> I only had three Spanish phrases in my arsenal, and one of them had just crashed and burned before my reddened eyes. With much watch pointing, the waiter explained himself. The kitchen didn't open until 8.30 p.m., giving me 90 minutes to keep ravening delirium at bay with beer and the tiny saucer of crisps it came served with. So began the ordeals that would make a malnourished, alcoholic mess of so many evenings ahead. That's the end of that reading bit. But uh, I've got some other things which I thought might be vaguely relevant to tonight's sort of theme. It's hard to imagine a more traumatic conflict, conflict than the one which broke out in Spain in 1936. A civil war is not a war, but a sickness, said the French writer Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. The enemy is within. One fights almost against oneself. When I read these words two years ago, in the midst of the first lockdown, I remember thinking that the pandemic was the nearest I've ever come, thank God, to living through a war. 
The curfews and shortages, the stirring sense of common purpose as people kept calm and carried on, and those awful moments when the mighty undercurrents of fear and mistrust broke through and everyone fought over bog rolls and tore each other's masks off on the bus and shot the neighbours for having a few friends round. The Spanish are such a gregarious and community-spirited people. Covid was so much harder for them to bear. When London lockdown eventually got too much even for me, going out for a ride felt like a break for freedom, a glorious release from all the oppressive dystopian weirdness. It seemed even more oppressive in Spain and so much sadder. All those dutiful mask wearers forced to restrain that hardwired native impulse to gather and hug and raucously spray each other with aerosol breath droplets. It was always a relief to hit the open road and leave all that behind, to carry on as if the whole world hadn't spun out of control, as if riding a really old bike for hours and hours in an open air oven was reassuringly mundane rather than completely nuts. But in truth, as we've been reminded by what's going on in Ukraine, to equate living through a pandemic with living through a war is an offensive comparison. Out on the road in Spain, I'd start every day off by getting my phone out at breakfast and Googling up the name of whatever town or village I was in, plus the words Guerra Civil, Civil War. Without fail, I'd summon up a terrible parade of fratricidal atrocities, my jaw slackening as I sat among tables of cheery, backslapping locals and read all the murderous things their grandparents had done to each other. But however difficult it was to square these horrors with the happy coexistence playing out around me, it also gave me hope. The Civil War's traumatic legacy was so deeply embedded that as I rode around Spain, I found that even young people were reluctant to discuss it, certainly not with some sweaty old English bloke who barely spoke a word of their language. Almost a century on, it was still too raw for many. When Berendero died in 1995, he was given a very muted send-off, with a few obituaries I found completely glossing over his years in the concentration camps. Franco had then been dead for 20 years, but even though Berendero had been on the right side of history, he was still tainted by association with this painful era, and thus best forgotten. But during my ride, I could sense that Spain was at last moving on. The Pacto del Olvido, the Pact of Forgetting, that bound a haunted nation to silence is starting to crack. The Spanish Civil War is no longer part of living history now that its last surviving witnesses have passed away. The victims in all those mass graves are at last being exhumed. TV histories and best-selling books are at last telling the story that Spain spent so long trying to erase from the national consciousness. It might have taken them two generations, but they're coming to terms with their past. And if a nation can heal itself after a civil war, there is surely no hatred or resentment that humankind cannot eventually overcome. Hopefully we've got some spontaneous questions from members of the audience or members of the English Society that uh, Mr Moore can ask, can, can answer. So. Any questions, anyone, about the art of writing, etc.? Do you notice the parallels between your adventures and um, as I walked out on Midsummer Morning? Uh, I've noticed that, that George Orwell was a better writer than me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was not really me, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, the thing about Spain is because rural Spain in particular is so unchanged, it was actually quite easy for me to, to put myself back in 1941 when you know the, the race I was retracing, and even in 1936, uh, which is probably about the same time that Laurie Lee was walking across it, wasn't it? So it, it's, 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 yes, it is quite easy to put yourself in the moment because you know all, all the scenery around you, all the houses around you, the people around you, they, they look like they've you know they haven't changed for 300 years. So in that perspective, yes, and um, yeah, there is, there is something very, very ageless about 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 <coughs> most of Spain. Most of Spain is still a very rural country. So yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah. How yeah. long was the um, bike ride with the wooden wheels? Uh, too long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most of these things. That, I mean, that that was. Uh, I think it was about uh, two and a half thousand kilometres. I'll still have a bike, actually, you want to come around home and like, I'll give you a go with it. <laughs> totally um, unwidely, petrifying. Um, so did you have the gear, you know, proper shorts and... Uh, I, I really went for it that time, so I had proper uh, 1914 cycling equipment. Um, which is? Which actually is made out of really, it's like a sort of fisherman's jump. It's like a 
Why? Why do that? Why give people wool to wear when they're going to recycle all day in boiling heat? Um, long sleeve, I had a silly kind of baker's boy hat and these absolutely absurd kind of blue tinted yeah. goggles that they used to wear, uh, which, I mean, literally small children would run away crying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the um, happening, but it wouldn't be mammal, it would be... It would be something kind of worse, something with pervert in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some, there's some people in the back there. Um, yeah. Have you always been into cycling, or was it just like the inspiration of writing the books that kind of got you on? Um, yeah, so have I always been into cycling? Well, actually, uh, this is this is my guilty secret that I'm, I'm not I'm not really into cycling that much, which is I think that, well I managed to fashion that into a positive because I, I, I do when I don't go on one of these gigantic rides, I don't really do any cycling. So when I do go on one of them, it's like I'm discovering all over again. So it's like a novelty for me. It's not some something I'm, I'm kind of you know bored to death with. Um, but yeah, I think I I, I was I got quite into. Um, watching cycling on telly when I was a student because um, the Tour de France highlights came after Countdown which obviously I spent most of my university career watching uh, and I was just too lazy to get up and turn it over <laughs> days before remote control um, so I just got drawn in that way and then uh, um, yeah then, then anyway I, I did some, some book about going across Iceland my first book and I was supposed to do some bit on a horse I thought, okay, I'm definitely not doing that. I'm terrified of horses, so I end up doing it on a bike, and then you know, one thing led to another. But yes, <laughs> that was another one. I think it's a bit random, but would you consider Lance Armstrong more of a saint or a sinner? <laughs> um, well, it's interesting actually because um, when I did my first book, 2000, that was right in the in the kind of um, that that was it. He was he was the man. So he was winning the Tour de France. He won that year's Tour de France and the other one. But because I then got sort of drawn into the, the inside group of, of, of people who knew, knew the secrets of cycling, like cycling journalists and authors and stuff, and I said, oh, wow, Lars Archer, well, it's amazing, isn't it? He said, oh, well, he's a massive taper. I said, what? <laughs> um, so, and then, then clearly, I mean, obviously, he, he's, uh, he, he comes across now, looking back to what we know about him, as uh, pretty horrid and a massive bully, apart from the else. But uh, I, I don't really, I mean, I can't really bear a grudge against him, partly because, uh, <laughs> from a totally selfish perspective, I think he just made cycling so much more of a sort of global sport. Um, you know, he, he cracked the states for, for you know for the sort of professional cycling, and therefore anyone who had anything to do with cycling, even in my sort of like peripheral way, um, got to ride very slightly on, on his coattails. Also, I just think you know if you're going to sort of uh, not like anyone who's a taper, then you basically might as well just give up because. Uh, I actually, I actually see, secretly think that I don't think anyone ever has won a Tour de France without doping. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, a bit of both. Um, I, I, find, I do find it hard to, to, to really kind of hate on him just because everyone did. I mean, I think the thing was he was, you know, he was he was very focused and very professional about his training and about everything else. And and part of that, in his eyes, was oh, I'm be very focused and professional about doping. So everyone was taking a bit. He just did it, you know. He just uh, he did it really, really professionally. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> was English like a passion of yours when you were in school? Oh, I didn't hear a bit of that. Was English a passion of yours when you were in school? Um. Well, my my wife who's just sitting down here will tell you I don't even I don't even read very many books. It's a bit embarrassing. Uh, she was says like you've you've written more books than you've read. But I'm not sure that's not true. <laughs> I, I did, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I did, I, I did, I've always been, I'm basically, it's, it's writing, the kind of writing I always used to do, I used to go on the holidays, you know, when I was a teenager, and send really silly postcards back to my friends and my parents and stuff, and, because um, in, in those days, before kind of phones and whatever else, you went away, you, you weren't, you couldn't really, that was it, you just had to have any way to communicate, it was to, so I'd write, really tiny, I'd write, write, you know, 400 words on a postcard, and it will end up being a sort of a, you know, sort of silly and uh, slightly surreal and a bit, a bit funny, I suppose. Um, but no, I didn't. I suppose I didn't really. I didn't, never imagined I would. I would be a, a serious writer. I think it was just a great relief to me when uh, it became apparent later on after I sort of started doing little bits of freelance journalism, doing things I was really not qualified to do, like going to. I, I, for some reason, 
ended up um, as, a, as a music journalist. I know nothing about music. And I remember getting to talk to you people, and you know, some guy would walk into the room, and I'd stand up and shake his hand, and say, and he said, oh, I've just come to change the photo of your time. Anyway, it, it just it just happened to happen to be that um, uh, Bill Bryson, who was some of the older people they might have heard of, came, came along and started writing, you know, basically going on, on, a, on a holiday and writing a funny book about it, and. Um, that was that was uh, he was my gateway into into that whole world. <laughs> yeah. So how do you um, evolve and complete the manuscript? Because you're so physically in the day, and yet you, you record quite subtle things as you go. How do you have time and energy to remember it and then to? I'm just a very special person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, actually, so when, I, when I was in fact when I did uh, you know, my first big cycling book, that was 22 years ago. So I was. Um, were A older and fitter, and uh, B, there was no other sort of technical means of doing this. So I did used to have a little notebook, shoved them back in my sweaty jersey pocket, and uh, and it was really, but it was really kind of so. So they, oh, that's an interesting thing. I, I must just stop here and write it down. But then you kept, then, you know, as I got older, I, I can't be having. I'll stop every five seconds to think of something which probably end up not being used anyway. So I, I have started making um, voice recordings on my phone. Which is quite, it's, it's really good insofar as, you know, things happen straight away and, the, oh, that, there's that and you, and you make a note of it. Um, so, uh, but that's a bit of a double-edged sword because you come home and feel like, well, I've, uh, I've, I've finished the book now. Oh, no, I haven't. I've got to now transcribe, three, you know, literally 3,000 voice recordings, which is, makes me hate everything to do with what I've just experienced. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible ordeal. Um, and, and also, I think there is, I, I, you know, I do miss the writing it down thing. Because I think when you're... Even if you're literally just uh, you know scribbling stuff in a notebook, in, in a slightly disjointed, like you know probably completely exhaustive um, way. Well, also, actually, I must say, I'm afraid to confess when I did that Tour de France ride, I, I was younger and fitter because it was a less enlightened age. I used to just drink loads of wine at lunchtime, so I was probably um, half cut as well. Uh, but you still nonetheless put things into into a kind of into some sort of you, 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 know, you make sort of jokes or you make I don't know you, you have a, a turn of phrase that curse you as you're writing down. Of course, if you're just uh, talking, um, as I'm afraid everyone here has experienced, I'm, I'm much more articulate writing these down than I am talking. So it's, um, yeah, I kind of, I, mi I do miss the, the notebook days, but I also used to get absolutely, towards the end of one of those trips, about, it was all in notebooks, I used to have like five or six tiny notebooks again with my little postcard type writing on them. And if I lose these, it, it, that, that's it, it's all over. Uh, and and the, the stress of the thought of just one of them slipping out of the back of my pocket or something just got too much to bear. So. Now on the phone, I do. I must say, I do back everything up into the cloud. It's not. It's not terribly romantic or interesting, but I do that every single night. Uh, yes, um, what advice would you give to some young aspiring writers? Well, uh, think of something that something that you like writing about. Not necessarily. Well, okay. So think of something you can. The, the writing about it makes you interested. Um, don't write. Never write too much because uh, they never want it to become a chore. I always say to people, if, uh, even if you've got, a, uh, I've got an amazing idea for a novel, don't, whatever you do, it's a bit sad to say this, but uh, don't write the whole thing down, um, because you know, no, no, if, if it comes to the point where you're thinking, well, I want to submit this, this is, this is really good, I want to submit this for, to agents or publishers, as soon as I see you've written a, a whole thing, they just think you're a leaning, and they, and they sort of put it into the bin, really. So, um, yeah, don't write too much, write a, you know, write a little synopsis. Um, but I think, yeah, and uh, just write things, uh, after you've written something down, read, read it out and see, see what it sounds like. Because it's writing, you know, I think, I'm always amazed that people, when they do dialogue, and, you, and you, when you read it in a book, they say, well, this doesn't sound like anyone actually said that. Surely you must have just, you know, sat at, you know, in front of your laptop or whatever while you were writing it up and read it out to yourself. But no, that doesn't sound like a real person talking. Um, so, yeah, re read it out to yourself afterwards. Um, <coughs> That's a bit scattered, isn't it? But there we go. Yep. Can you say a little bit more about your writing process? Are you like a 500 words a day, or are you like, I've got to finish this chapter, then I go to the pub? Or? Um, well, uh, again, it's, it's, it is a little bit um, sad when I think back to it. I remember when I did my first book, I was so, I can't believe I've been, someone's asked me to write a book, this is absolutely unbelievable. And I would had you know anyway I did two and a half thousand words a day and I literally could I could I could have carried on through the night I just couldn't get enough of it, um, uh, but obviously there's, there's, as as you get a bit older and more jaded it gets a bit harder, um, so I then I'm now down but if I do a thousand words a day I'm I'm very happy with that 
there were times actually when um, certain books, I mean, at least with the cycling books, I am always, I found a way of doing, even if I, I, I like I, I really said I'm not really necessarily that into cycling, I always find something which has a historical backdrop that I am really interested in. So I can, I can, I can just sort of focus on that and keep my interest going. Um, but uh, yeah, oh, I actually forgot what I was just saying now. <laughs> what did you ask me again? Uh, the writing process. So oh yeah, well, so yeah, thousand this? words a day. Um, with is is uh, you know, but on, on other books that aren't the recycling, something that I'm not engaged with. I, I, for instance, made a terrible decision to write a book about the Eurovision Song Contest, and that was really like blood from a stone. Right now, I used to get my daughter, who was the one who didn't get to the school, I'm afraid, um, to uh, she had her first phone. I used to get to like sort of. Uh, text me at lunchtime saying, uh, Daddy, have you done 500 words yet? Every single day. So that was a sort of guilt trip me into making sure I'd done, I did 500 words in the morning, then two, uh, and then text me on the bus on the way home. Have you done the other 500 words yet? Uh, so I think that's that's key, getting back to what I was up to. Just find, find something you're interested in. Don't, whatever you do, start writing about things that you're not interested in. Can I ask a follow-up? So, uh, are you a big rewriter? Or is um, it 500 words and you're done there? That was gold and I move on. Yeah, I, I must say, I don't, I don't really, and I, and I really, exactly, I, I always end up actually, uh, as people who uh, may, may, may just you know, have the misfortune of buying my books, I do tend to go on a bit too much. And I think, you know, there's always this sort of rule of thumb, and a page of a, a book that you're, you know, when you get a book off the shelf, there's about 330 words on a page. So in other words, you do 100,000 words, that's 300 pages, and that's, that's certainly for my kind of book, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a great novelist a lot of times, so that that's, that should be enough. And I always tend to like, oh God, I've written too many words again. But I, by the same token, uh, any writer, well, any writer who, is, is, who says, oh, I'm very happy to, to cut things down, is lying. Because <laughs> that is awful. Because clearly, it may, may not be that, you know, when an editor looks at it, says, oh, I'm not sure about this chapter, Tim, or, you know. And I think, well, you know, as if somehow, oh, yeah, you're right, that's crap. Well, clearly, I didn't think it was crap, so I've, I've never written it down. <laughs> and doing it. Um, I mean, I, I, I can I can see this. I'm always really relieved when they say, oh, "Okay, that's it. Yeah, that's fine." Um, even though I secretly think, actually, you probably should have asked me to cut twenty thousand words out of that, but I'm glad you didn't because I didn't want to do that. <laughs> yes. No, I, so I don't really. Sometimes, you know, um, if they're obviously the most critical bit of the book is the beginning. So if you don't grab it at the beginning, you you sort of you've had it. So I quite often uh, am asked to. <laughs> uh, Rejig the start to, to kind of go into the middle of the action rather than the thing. Oh, and then one day I had an idea about doing a bicycle race, and then I got on a bicycle. So start you know, have a bit, just which is like you know, I'm right in the middle of the bike race, just you know, kind of uh, draw people in that way. Uh, just is it uh, yeah, you're interested. Yeah. Yep. So when it comes to writing, do you ever plan out your uh, plan out story or what you're going to write? What is it? Would you just write what comes out of your mind? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky in a way because uh, effectively, uh, like going back to when I first started writing by just sending long rambling postcards to my to my family and friends, that's that's kind of still what I do. That's on a, on a bigger scale. So I don't. There's not really. It's just you know it, exactly. Uh, some people quite regularly ask me, like, "Well, what about being a novelist?" Like, I just don't. I just don't have that. Sadly, that that level of imagination. If I haven't actually done it myself. I, I can't really kind of, uh, I don't know where to start. So um, so it's not, for, from that kind of uh, structural form, it's, it's not really terribly demanding. I just, I don't have to sort of, you know, it's, it's just, oh yeah, and then I, you know, I started and then I finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Anne. I have to confess, I love Twitter, and it's really influenced me with reading. I find it really difficult to read books now because I like everything to be hardly any characters and immediately telling me something. And I just wondered how that, because you you last wrote your cycling book 20 years ago, and social media has really changed since then, and the way we are processing language is really changing. And is that influencing what your editor is feeding back to you, the way you, how does that influence you as a writer, as a processor, <coughs> what have you? Well, it certainly influences my editors in so far as they say, like, Tim, you really need to be really active on social media and make a lot of understanding. <laughs> I just like, yeah, I, I'm just very, very lazy about that. But yes, I can see that there obviously is, I don't want to say that you've got like, a high attention span, that would be insulting. But, um, you know, <laughs> that's right with that. no, but I mean, that's just the way it is. So, so I know that exactly, for instance, my children have never read a single one of my books. But this is what I'm thinking, because yeah, a lot of people have never, never even read I've really, at this stage, I don't care anymore. But I, I find it quite, 
but also, you know, there's a, I've got a record you know, vanity shelf in my little office, <laughs> and, and they've never ever even thought, oh, I'm taking off that I, I think it's just because, well, yeah, you know, reading an entire book like that, particularly if I still don't have any pre existing interest in it, often they're like their dads in it, and often they're in it, they'll never know. Um, <laughs> so I probably ought to be thinking about ways of doing that. And I, I, do, I do think, I, for instance, when e-books came along, um, everyone got to, uh, you know, talking about just 10 years ago or something, um, they thought, okay, well that's it, publishing has changed forever, the uh, traditional book is dead, um, no one's going to go and like, oh, come on, daddy, you're like you're there with your big thing of paper and you know, dead trees and stuff. Um, but I realised quite, quite quickly, actually, I thought, well, I'm a, you know, I, I, there's something about having a book, which is actually really, it's not just because it's a, it's a nice object and you can put it on, it's actually more practical and useful. You know, you can you know you can read a bit of it in the bath, and you can pick it up. It's it's actually more practical. I think. I so on that basis, I think uh, you know, I think do people do like that. If you go on, there was a phase I did on the on the on the train, and everyone would have um have uh, you know Kindles out or whatever else we need books. So now I've noticed actually it seems to be that people are reading actual long form books again. Um, obviously, I hope so because uh, otherwise I'm sure. <laughs> Could you describe something what's like walking around Spain with a donkey? Yes, well, that was uh, I, I did a I, I did a previous book about Spain, which didn't involve a bicycle, but did involve a donkey. So um, yeah, I did the, there's this sort of well, the, probably the most famous pilgrimage that there is. So it's the Camino de Santiago. Um, again, so there, there's always there, many many years ago, some some guy wrote a book called Round Ireland with a Fridge. Um, and you know, I, I was shamelessly there at that, you know, kind of thing. Oh, that's it. So the whole novelty quest thing uh, became a bit of a, a bit of a fad in, in uh, publishing. And um, so, you know, when I said to my, my publisher, well, you know, I quite fancy uh, doing this thing with good people, so I'm talking about, oh, what about this pilgrimage? Um, they said, well, yeah, we can't just like can't just do it in book or something like that. So it was always a thing. Like, oh, um, so I ended up doing it. With so that was. Uh, well, it was. I mean, I was always, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I kind of bonded with the donkey quite, quite strongly you know, by the end. But most of the time, I was um, terrified of it. And uh, um, yeah, I just, I think, any animal larger than a cat was uh, is, is beyond me, really. So, um, but that was well. Absolutely, you're, you're never alone with the donkey. I can say that everyone. You know, I think because it's so much part of, you know, Spanish rural life. Um, and because, well, because it was, and because in the space of half a generation, have they gone from having billions of donkeys to having no donkeys? So you get people who would rush out, oh, blah, 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 and they're absolutely, uh, you know, you, you're kind of becoming sort of celebrity. <laughs> um, also, it's just it was quite good because you do go through on that on that route a number of quite large cities, uh, and just taking a donkey across, um, you know, zebra crossings is just really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was that was memorable. Yeah, just going to have one one more question. Uh, you mentioned how much racing bikes have changed over the years. Given the opportunity of time travel with a modern bike back in time, and what you fancy your chances of winning that race? <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, I do, I do, I, I, well actually, I, I must even more shamefully confess that I did hang in today, which I can say I did that only because I didn't want to sound like I'm sweating like on my <coughs> electric bicycle. Um, so and I, I do sometimes think, yeah, well, if I just, you know, if I'd had my electric bike, I'd have been able to come at home. Uh, I think, but I think that in the end, you know, the, the equipment is not really, it's not really a factor. I mean, you know, bikes. I mean, if you look at a bike, it still looks fundamentally the same as it did when it was kind of invented. You know, for, for, you know the, the overall geometry and like two wheels and the frame and stuff. It might be made out of different things, but you know, sadly, I, I do. I think, yeah. But if you look at the, the obviously the, the speeds have gone up gigantically over the average speed of these races, but that's um, not really so much to do with bikes getting better. It's the road surface getting better and um, and people uh, taking things to make it better. <laughs>